You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I'm Paul Garner. And I'm Todd Wood. Uh, And a special welcome to all of our new subscribers. Uh, You are very uh, welcome to be here. And uh, and of course, all of our regular listeners who've been with us for a long time, you're also uh, very welcome. Uh, of course, if if you're here for the first time and you're not a subscriber, then do make sure that you hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you get notification of all our um, content. We've got lots of fun things coming up. And uh, if you enjoy what we're doing, why don't you tell your friends? You know, Share this with your friends, uh, put it on social media, encourage other people to subscribe. We would be um, very glad to uh, grow our audience even more, but we're we're very pleased to have you here. Uh, now, Todd, um, we have been doing uh, an intermittent series on biblical chronology alongside lots of other intermittent series yes. on all kinds of other oh, topics, including yeah. radiometric dating and natural <laughs> evil. But we have this um, series on biblical chronology. And so we're, we're back for another episode in that series today. Uh, now, just to recap for uh, you know people who are joining us, uh, we started off with with a, an episode where we kind of did a big overview didn't we of all all of the kind of problems and, and 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 issues that arise when we think about biblical chronology that was episode 54 and then we had a couple of great interviews we had uh, Doug Smith who came to talk to us about the Masoretic text the Hebrew text of the Old Testament so that was episode 67 and we had Henry Smith no relation to Doug Smith <laughs> as far right. as I know as far as I know, <laughs> um, as far as I know, uh, we had Henry Smith talking to us about the Septuagint, which is the uh, the Greek text of the of the Old Testament. So uh, that was episode fifty nine, and they really very helpfully set the scene for us to look at, um, yeah, the, those different texts because, as we're going to see in this episode, they give us some different numbers. Uh, that are relevant to biblical chronology that we need to think about. They have variations in the ages of the patriarchs and so on. Uh, And so that's what we're coming to in this episode. We want to kind of dig a bit deeper into the the substance of those disagreements in in those texts. So, yeah. So, okay. So setting the scene then, Todd, um, we've got these two chapters in Genesis, Genesis 5 and Genesis chapter 11. And they uh, they contain these uh, unique genealogies. People remember those lists of begats. Oh yeah. And uh, they give us some crucial information. Uh, we have information about the ages of each person at the time that they begat the next person in line. And uh, if we sort of just take those numbers at face value, and we simply add them up i mean it seems straightforward that we could just sort of you know we could make a calculation and we could work out the span of time from the creation of adam right through to the birth of abraham and as we've pointed out in previous episodes this is basically what christians have been doing for a very very long time this this is not a novelty this is not something that just arose with the modern creationist movement it goes back to the earliest days of the church so what's the problem with this, Todd? Um, what what's the confusion here? Why can't we just take the number numbers, take one of these texts, take the numbers right. at face value, add up right. the numbers, and come up with a with an age for the creation of Adam? What's the problem? Yeah. So so setting the stage then, um, and I wanna and I wanna point out to you and the rest of the audience, I've got a lot of notes on this episode. So if you see me staring down while we talk, that's that's me reading my notes because this is super detailed. And I'm sure everybody tuning in was looking forward to a, a you know an hour long discussion of detailed numbers and lists of things. But I'll try to make it interesting at least. So if you, if you think back, Paul, you probably have the King James b- version of your Bible the authorized version, there it is, open up and you look in that middle column of notes that's usually present in such things, and you will have that that 4004 BC date on that, just like I did. 
in in circles that I grew up in, we had Schofield reference Bibles. Everybody has a Schofield reference Bible. And Schofield, he was a gap theory guy. He said that Genesis 1-1 was, you know, some distant time period in the past, but but the creation week was 4004 BC. And he got that from James Usher, who was the bishop, the the archbishop of the Irish church um, in the uh, first half of the 17th century. And he, like many of his contemporaries, made a great study of these these ages in the Bible and secular historical records trying to sort of figure out, all right, well, how many years does the Bible actually span and how does it relate to our historical records, right? So he's the one who came up with this 4004 BC. Now, you've also mentioned uh, that Christians have been doing this basically from the beginning of the church. And you are right. They have. Um, one of the earliest ones that I can find is uh, a guy named uh, Theophilus of Antioch. He was a he was a bishop as well, Bishop of Antioch. And this is the Antioch that's mentioned in the book of Acts rather extensively. This is where Paul set out on his missionary journeys, for example. Um, so, you know. This is kind of a big deal. I mean, he's in this classic Christian city. Uh, he's um, he's a bishop. He's the seventh bishop of Antioch. And he wrote something called uh, variously the Apology to Autolycus or the Letters to Autolycus. And in the third book of this of this um, book, I mean, they, they divide ancient books into books. So there's book one, two and three. And in the third one in the uh, Apology to Autolycus, he gives this extensive series of calculations where he gives the age of the earth at his date, which was, you know, end of the second century. And he says that it's 5,698 years old at that point. Now, if you do your math there a little bit, you'll come up with that's the date of 5,500 B.C., Versus Usher's date of 4004 BC. And, you know, some of that difference is going to be different historical records, different choices on how to sort of anchor the biblical records onto the, the outside secular historical records. But a big chunk of that, I mean, that's 4000 BC versus 5500 BC. That's 1,500 years. That's not just going to be minor differences of opinion on exactly when the temple was destroyed. So most of that is going to be related to the differences between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. So Usher was using the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text that was standardized and preserved by the Masoretes at the, in the late antiquity period. And the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation from Alexandria, Egypt. And if you sort of work out, say, the differences there, um, if you look at Genesis 5, the time period from creation to the birth of Noah's sons, uh, the Masoretic has that time period as uh, 1,556 years. And the Septuagint records 2,142 years. So that's about 600 years difference. And then after the flood in Genesis 11, the Septuagint has 1,070 years from the birth of Arphaxad, which is the son of Shem, to the birth of Abraham. And the Masoretic gives uh, only 290 years for the same time span. <laughs> so. That's another 700 years. So that's a this is, these are whopping big differences here. Um, mm. And if you look even closer, you'll notice that the Septuagint has a whole extra name. There's this there's this Canaan guy. So the Masoretic has uh, Arphaxad begetting uh, Shelah in, in 11 verse 12. But the Septuagint has this whole intervening son. Arphaxad begets a guy named Canaan who then begets Shelah. So 
Yeah, put it all together. You've got like 13, 1400 years of difference between the Septuagint and the Masoretic. And that's why Theophilus has, you know, 5,700 year old Earth at his day. And my, my um, Bishop Usher chronology from my Schofield Bible has it being about 6,000 years to today which is 1700 years later. So yeah, Usher used the Masoretic and Theophilus used the Septuagint. And so there you go. That's the main yeah. difference. Yeah. I, that, that's, that's quite a big difference. So yeah, in, in effect, if, if we go by the Septuagint dates, we have an earth that's about 7,500 years old, something like that. Um, give or take. And if we go by the Masoretic, it's, it's you know, about 6,000 years old, 4,004 BC, so it's yep. about 6,000 yep. years. And the Septuagint uh, date for creation, then, is about 25% longer than the Masoretic date. I mean, that's that's quite a difference. Yeah, yeah. And it's not it's not a difference of, you know, and and I think this is a really important thing to point out, and, and we should probably emphasize this as we go through here, because this may be confusing to people. This is not trying to squeeze evolution into the Bible, right? Right. <laughs> Whatever this was, evolution wasn't even uh, a, a no. thought in people's minds. And going from 6,000 to 7,000, that, that is a lot of time. You're right. That is 25%. Longer, 7,500 is 25 percent longer than 6,000, but it's not 13 billion or whatever. So, so right. I want to make sure everybody listening or, or watching, yeah, can keep up with us on this. We are not talking about anything that is any any benefit or help to anybody trying to reconcile, you know, millions of radiometric gears with the Bible. This is no. this is sort of a a question for young age creationists, first of all. So yeah, that, that that's a good question. So so the question then, Todd, people are grappling basically with these these numbers that they have in the text, whatever the text is in front of them, whether it's the yep. Masoretic or the Septuagint. Yep. Um, but it kind of raises the question: then, what? Why? Why are they different? Why? Yes. And 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 perhaps you know more to the point: can we say is one correct and the other incorrect? Right. You know what 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 what's the situation here? Yeah. So to sort of get into answering those kinds of questions, we kind of have to look at what exactly the differences are, right? Because you could imagine, well, I can imagine, let's put it that way, I can imagine lots of reasons why these things might be different. And I think in the introduction, the introductory episode of the series, we sort of laid out a few ideas. One idea was that uh, the Egyptian chronology is quite long, and so maybe the translators of the Septuagint in Egypt decided eh, we better we better we beef this up to make it com competitive with the Egyptian chronology, um, and so they made it longer, and so that might be one reason. Another reason might be you know going the other direction. It might be that the 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 Masoretes were annoyed with Christians. Um, because they were using the, they were, and this is kind of complicated, but they were using the idea of Jesus being born in the sixth millennium as a symbol for Adam being created on the sixth day. And so you could imagine the Jews not liking the Christians might say, all right, well, let's, let's shorten this chronology so that that doesn't happen. And they can't make that argument anymore. So there, you, you can imagine motives going either direction to shorten a longer chronology or lengthen a short chronology. But I can also imagine just errors, just errors creeping in, because, you know, whenever you're writing down numbers and lots of numbers, uh, it's really complicated. How how many times have you been to a website and been uh, asked for your uh, your email address, or your phone number? And there's two of them right there. And they ask you to put it in twice because they know you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> so they make sure that you've typed it the same both times because people get things wrong like that. So, yeah. 
So let's start with Genesis 5. Um, so Genesis 5, we have every man listed in the chapter, uh, except for Noah at the end. Um, so we'll just deal with Noah. Noah's kind of one of those pivotal guys who's not quite in the Genesis 5 genealogy, and he's not quite in the Genesis 11 genealogy fully. I mean, he's mentioned, but not entirely. But anyway, the other men mentioned have three ages listed, right? So there's an age at which they beget their son that's listed. There's the time period that they live, the number of years they live after the begetting. And then they add them up and they say that the total length of the life was this many years. And that's the formula that gets repeated throughout there until you get to Noah and Noah has Noah's got a special format because he's introducing the flood narrative. Okay. Now, so that gives us a sense of what numbers are listed. So when we look at the um the total lifespans in the Septuagint and the Masoretic, they're pretty close to the same. There's a couple of there's a couple of differences. We'll we'll get to that here in a second. Um Lamech is is the big one. Um but otherwise Otherwise, the total ages are the same. So this is one thing that makes it really strange, right? The begetting and the lifespan ages then, or, or the, the post-begetting lifespan, those are the places where the differences happen. And the, LX, uh, the, the LXX, the Septuagint, differs from the Masoretic consistently by exactly 100 years for the first five generations. So in, in the Septuagint, it's a hundred years longer before they beget. And, or you might say in the Masoretic, it's a hundred years shorter than the Septuagint. And then after that, right, the adjustment is the opposite, right? The, 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 the time after begetting is shorter, a hundred years shorter in the Septuagint than it is in the Masoretic. And that's for the first five generations. Um, then you have uh, the sixth generation is Jared. His ages are exactly the same in the Septuagint and Masoretic. Enoch is number seven. His begetting age is a hundred uh, more in the Septuagint than the Masoretic. So he follows the pattern of the first five generations. And then it gets kind of weird and fuzzy. Methuselah's begetting age seems to be 167 in the Septuagint but 187 in the Masoretic, so it's off by 20, which is odd. And then Noah's father, Lamech, um, begets at 188 in the Septuagint, but 182 in the Masoretic. And then Noah has his sons uh, at the same age in both the Masoretic and the Septuagint. So... So you've got that those first five generations, which are off by exactly 100 years, and you think, oh, well, the, this is the pattern. And then you get all these other weird random things at the end and you think, all right, well, I'm not sure what the pattern is anymore. So it's mm. but it strikes me as real suspicious. <laughs> it's exactly yeah. 100 years. Yeah, it, it kind of. Yeah, it, it seems sort of contrived in, in some kind of way. So so you've got, you know, this it's exactly 100 years for the first five generations. Uh, and then you've got the begetting ages and the time after begetting a change by the same amount. So that the total age stays, stays the, the same. same. Um, yeah, I mean, that seems really weird. So the question, I, I guess, is, you know, how on earth can we explain this? How, right. how could this have happened? Right. So the first thing that I thought of is how do how are the numbers recorded in the text? Right. Because I can easily imagine stray marks on a page that get interpreted as a one, right? Or maybe I write down uh, an eight really sloppy and someone thinks it's a nine, right? So you could, if you're, if you're writing in digits, you can imagine a situation where 
you the digits get off because you just made an error. Um, and the idea that it's exactly a hundred. So I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe there's some way that they're writing down these numbers that explains why they would get off by exactly a hundred. So I looked it up, right? We have access to the Hebrew and the Greek text. So how do they write their numbers? And the answer is, um, they're all written out as words <laughs> in hmm. both in both the Hebrew Masoretic and in the Greek Septuagint. So uh, my idea that, you know, maybe it's just uh, accidental, accidental marks on a page that's out. Um, it's it's not because of that, because you actually have to change the words. And in some cases, you right. have to add in new words altogether to make this thing be different. And so it's not as simple as as just stray marks. So it's starting to sound to me like there was a deliberate change. Right. And so, you know, if you read this kind of literature about these differences, you will definitely run across these ideas of the, the Septuagint people trying to stretch out the, 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 the chronology and the Masoretic people trying to shrink it. That starts to make sense because you can pretty much rule out the idea that they just made one or two stray marks and, and got the math wrong and sort of tried to make it all work out again. Yep. That's, that's not plausible. And I should also say, mm. interestingly, we've mentioned the Sumerian Kings list before on we the did. introductory episode and how it has um, extremely long periods of, of when these um, pre-flood kings were reigning. So this is, a, this is a mythical document from the Sumerian culture. The Sumerian Kings list um, records the numbers using digits. Well, not exactly digits. They're symbols of numbers, um, but it's a single symbol. So this is another one, uh, another one of those instances where the, the Sumerian kings list, even though it does have these weird long reigns for these kings, it's really not the same as what you have uh, in the the Old Testament, um, because the Sumerian kings list has these these num numeric symbols for these ages and the and the Hebrew uh, spells it out. So when you see in your Bible where it says, you know, Adam lived 130 years and begat Seth. And it's spelled out as 130 years. That is pretty much exactly how it reads in the Greek and in the Hebrew. It's not digits. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Now, Todd, you mentioned something uh, about Lamech. Oh. Um, you said there was something a bit strange about um, uh, about Noah's father, Lamech. Yeah. So just just unpack that just a bit more. Yeah. So Lamech, Lamech becomes kind of odd. Um, and I'm yeah. So I mentioned, you know, at the at, at when I when I dis, when I presented you the differences, I said, look at these things. In, in Genesis five, they're they're different by exactly a hundred years, and it's very suspicious. And I said, you know, it's not digits, so it's got to be something else. Okay, then the the back half of the chronology is where things get all weird, and you get these odd differences. So, for example, the birth of Lamech happens when Methuselah was a hundred and sixty seven years old in the Septuagint, but when he was a hundred and eighty seven in the Masoretic. And, okay, what that does, and this is, this is the peculiar part, if Lamech is born when Methuselah was 167, then Methuselah lives 14 years after the flood. Oh. <laughs> right. So, right. And, and the Bible gives us pretty clear you know, there's eight people on the ark, Noah, his three sons and all their wives. No, Methuselah is not on the not on the ark. And the Bible's also pretty clear. Everything outside the ark died. 
So, yeah, that's a problem. Now, if Methuselah is born, I'm sorry, if, if Lamech is born when Methuselah is 187, then the problem basically goes away. Okay, now, this is where, uh, this is where it starts to get complicated, because we're going to have to consult some other sources, some other ancient sources. So, one of the, to sort of sort through what is going on here. So, one of those ancient sources is a guy named Demetrius the Chronographer. Demetrius is uh, a Jewish scholar who lived in Alexandria about 200 years before Christ. Uh, and he has, he was one of the earliest that we know of that used the Old Testament records to create a chronology. Hence the name Demetrius the Chronographer, as opposed to, say, Demetrius the Scribe. No, he's a chronographer. He's actually creating a chronology. Um, and this is 400 years roughly, maybe a little less than that, that uh, between him and um, Theophilus of Antioch. So I mentioned Theophilus at the start of this episode as one of the earliest Christian individuals who does this uh, chronology writing. Uh, so here's Demetrius. He's a Jewish scholar doing this. Now, we don't have all of his figures, but we do have the time that he lists or Genesis 5. And it's long. So it's as long as you would expect from the Septuagint chronology. So he's obviously using a long, this, this set of numbers that are off by a hundred from what is written in the Masoretic. But it's also different from what we have in the Septuagint by exactly 20 years. So some people speculate that, in fact, the that the original age that um, Lamech was born was 187 and not 167, which means that Methuselah would have died six years before the flood rather than 14 years after. So that's really kind of interesting. Why would why would Demetrius the chronographer be off by exactly 20 years there? Now here's a name that some of our listeners might recognize, um Josephus. Um Josephus is very famous for writing the book uh his book The Antiquities of the Jews. So Demet uh, uh Josephus lived about the time he was born about the time that Jesus was uh, carrying out his ministry in Judea, um, and he was a uh, a soldier in the Jewish war against Rome. You might remember when the temple got destroyed in AD seventy, right? There was there was preceded by this Jewish revolt against Rome. He was a soldier in that. He was, I think, he was like a general. He was some higher up official in that. And he um, basically saw the handwriting on the wall and surrendered to uh, the Romans, and he was taken as a slave. And so Antiquities of the Jews is sort of, uh, it's sort of his effort to explain to a Roman audience, why are they like that? <laughs> right? Why, why do they keep revolting against, Jew uh, against Roman rule and that sort of thing? So, so in Antiquities of the Jews, uh, Josephus uh, summarizes the Old Testament and he creates a chronology again. And in that chronology, he records uh, that Methuselah's begetting age was 187, not 167. But again, he is using what appear to be the uh, Septuagint ages, right? So they're, uh, it's, it's quite a bit longer. Uh, than what we have in the Masoretic. So that suggests that he was using the Septuagint, but if he was using the Septuagint, he was using a Septuagint that had 187, not 167. So, yeah, so this is a kind of a puzzler. That's 
that's the birth of Lamech, right? There's there's uh, the manuscripts that we have in the Septuagint list his his the age at which Methuselah beget as 167. But these other ancient witnesses to the Septuagint chronology seem to take it that it was 187, not 167. So that's that's Lamech problem number one. Lamech problem number two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is his lifespan, right? I mentioned that the lifespans in in uh, the total lifespans in Genesis 5 are all the same except for Lamech. Mm. So in Septuagint, uh, it gives his lifespan as 753. But the Masoretic has it as, as 777. And you might think that this might could be, my first thought was, well, this is probably because of dying in the year of the flood, right? That must be it, right? Because Methuselah has that problem. And so maybe that's what's going on here. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Because... Um, if you if you sort of work it out, I, I don't really want to go through all the exact numbers here, but the in in the Masoretic version of the story, uh, Lamech dies five years before the flood happens. But if you follow the Septuagint chronology, he dies thirty five years before the flood. So neither one of them are in danger of outliving the flood. So the change in his total year. His total lifespan doesn't seem to be related to, um, you know, trying to get him dead before the flood happens. So the major difference, and this I thought was really fascinating, seems to be the, the, the that third number we haven't mentioned yet, really talked much about, and that is that lifespan after the begetting, the years he lived after he begat, and in the um, the Masoretic, he is living at 595 years after begetting. And in the Septuagint, he is living 565 years after begetting. So the difference is exactly 30 years. Now, because this is words again, remember that. So we're not dealing with digits here. So it's not just 30 years difference. The difference is actually that middle word, 60 versus 90, right? Because in Hebrew and in Greek, it would be the same. It would be 560 and 5, 590 and 5. I don't know that they would exactly have all the ands in there, but you get the idea. It's 565, 595. So the difference is 60 versus 90. Now, here's what's really interesting about that. In the Greek, right? 90... The word 90 is the nenakanta. And nenakanta is the word 90. And 60 is the word hexakanta. Which is actually right. that that prefix there is the part that makes it six versus nine. And it's spelled very similarly. Yeah. So I'm looking at that thinking, okay, I could imagine a situation where you have Anenakanta accidentally read as exakanta. So you go from 90 being read as 60. And then that's one manuscript. And then some scribe comes along later and realizes, well, that doesn't add up. And so he changes the total lifespan to fit. That seems actually fairly plausible to me. Now, there's a third problem here with Lamech. <laughs> I'm sorry we keep doing this. Um, and that is the begetting age, right? The the age at which this this is why the this is why the scribes made these errors. You know, it's it's because their eyes were glazing over at yes. all the begets. <laughs> because I, you, frankly, my eyes are glazing over just trying to describe all this stuff. So Lamech problem number three. Lamech problem number one is Methuselah's uh, birth uh, year, and that seems to be uh, the year at which Methuselah begat him, and that seems to be plausibly resolvable. Problem number two was his total lifespan. That seems plausibly resolvable with the Ananaconta versus Exaconta. And now problem number three, 182, 
is the year he begat um, Noah in the Masoretic of verses 188 is the year he begat Noah in the um, Septuagint. Now, I, I looked up the um, the Greek words thinking maybe, you know, maybe uh, it's another anenakonta, exakonta kind of thing. And we could we could explain it as just misreading. No, that doesn't seem to be. The Greek for two would have been duo. The Greek for eight would be octo. Now, it's true. The D in Greek is the delta, right? So it has it's basically a circle with a little curly Q on top. And octo would start with uh, uh, Omicron. So it, that would be, that would look like an O. So I guess it's maybe plausible. But what's interesting about this is that there are variant manuscripts of the Septuagint that have, that match the, the, the Masoretic. So in this, in this case, you know, maybe, again, we have reason to suspect that the Septuagint was really originally matching the Masoretic in all three of Lamech's problems. Um, now, the, the, there's a fourth problem. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and that is Josephus. Josephus lists um, Lamech's lifespan as 707 years. And we mentioned already he's using the long chronology of the Septuagint, and he gives testimony that Methuselah's begetting age matches the Masoretic begetting age. So where is 707 coming from? Well, remember, again, we're writing out words. So you've got 777 uh, versus 707. And I guess you could imagine somebody just left out the 70. Maybe. Maybe that's hard to reconstruct. I don't know. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, so the basic idea is there were there were some corruptions that that creeped into the the actual Septuagint that got corrected by modifying his um his uh lifespan. And then it seems like a different corruption crept into um Josephus. Are you confused yet? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um yeah, this this is really quite uh complicated yes uh, and, yes uh, yeah and I, I i hope our audience isn't sort of drifting off at this point be, because you know these, these are these are important questions because we're we're trying to get to grips you know with with these variants and why the variants are there right and yeah you know, and what they mean um and and this is this is an important question um but yeah it's 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 hard it um, is yeah so it, it might be helpful i think at this point having kind of gone through a lot of detail just to try to sort of sum up and remember we're only dealing with the genesis 5 genealogy at this yeah. point we, we haven't come on to genesis 11 um just sum up for us what the differences are in genesis 5 between the masoretic and the septuagint can we can we kind of crystallize it i think for so our audience yeah, i think so the main thing that you need to know that's the most important thing i think is that in genesis 5 there are exactly six generations that differ in their begetting ages by exactly a century. And their post-begetting ages are modified by a century as well, so that their lifespans are all the same. There are some really, there's some really peculiar discrepancies around Lamech, but they seem to be plausibly explainable by scribal errors at some point in the manuscripts that we have um, versus manuscripts that have been lost. But um, the, the six generations, the first five plus the seventh Enoch, those do not seem to be plausibly explainable by scribal error. It looks like someone deliberately modified the words either to make the chronology longer or to make the chronology shorter. And the idea that they would deliberately modify only the begetting ages or the begetting ages and the post-begetting time spans, that suggests that they had in mind, indeed, to change the actual chronology, that they were trying to modify the time span that's recorded, rather than something to do with the symbolism 
maybe of the the lifespan of the patriarch. So that's basically it. The if you if if you if you if you if your attention wandered and you're thinking I can't keep track of all this number nonsense, cool. I that's why I wrote it all down because I can't keep track of it either. <laughs> um, the main message you should gotta remember is that 600 years that differ on those six generations by exactly 100 years each. That's really strange. That's not a scribal error. There's not really any plausible way to attribute that to a scribal error. Yeah, that makes that's, sense. That's that. Yeah, that that's a very helpful summary. And and I yeah, I I think I've kind of got that. So so that's Genesis five. But what about the other genealogy, Genesis chapter eleven? Yeah. Um. G- g- give me the bad news. I mean, do do we do we have a sim- <laughs> do we have similar complexities when we come to Genesis eleven? Yes. Yes, there are similar <laughs> complexities. There's a, there's a big... I, I I feared you might say. Yeah, that. yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But I'm I'm I hope I don't have to get into quite so much detail. I I I'll run down a couple of numbers, but I think we're going to try to not get lost in the weeds here. There's no Lamech problem this time. That's 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 good. So, um uh, the big thing that we should note here before we get started on this, um looking at uh five verses eleven we have uh a big difference in five verses eleven and that is Genesis five gives us three ages for each patriarch it gives us the age at which he begat his son he gives it gives the number of years he lived after begetting his son and then it adds them up for you so that you can have the total lifespan specified. Genesis 11 only gives you two ages. It gives you the begetting age and the time after begetting. So Genesis 11 does not add up the ages so that you can come up with a total lifespan. It basically leaves that to you. So that's that's the thing. And we already mentioned, we said, you know, the 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 pre-flood Genesis 5 chronology was off by about 600 years and now you know looking at the post-flood chronology in genesis 11 it's off by about 700 years more than 700 years so the difference here and this is going to sound completely weird but the difference is almost exactly the same there are uh the first six generations uh in genesis 11 Their begetting ages are exactly 100 years different in the Masoretic versus the Septuagint. So where the Masoretic uh, has one age, the Septuagint simply adds 100 to it, or vice versa. The Septuagint has one age, the Masoretic subtracts 100 years. That's the first six generations, and that's the begetting ages. Um, Then we have... uh, Abraham's grandfather, Nahor, he begat Terah, who is Abraham's father. Uh, That's listed as 29 years in the Masoretic, but 79 in the Septuagint. So for some reason, that's off by only 50 years. Okay, so that's, that's the difference to start with. Then, uh, we, we mentioned, right, that the that the the Masoretic or the or the the post begetting ages in Genesis five also differ by exactly a hundred years, so that the lifespan which is given in Genesis five, the total lifespan is the same, roughly, mm. except for Lamech. But here, that's not the case, and this is where, <laughs> you know, just as I think I'm I'm getting it. Oh, they just modified the the begetting ages by a hundred years. No. They modify the post begetting lifespan as well. And it doesn't seem to be a lot of sense to it. So, for example, the the there's there's four patriarchs that differ in their post begetting ages. Our Faxad and Shela, who come at the beginning of the genealogy. Our Faxad is the grandson of Noah. 
and then Eber and Nahor. Um, now Peleg and Ru, uh, in the middle, they have the same post uh, begetting age. Uh, but for our facts, add the difference is 403 in the Masoretic versus 430 in the Septuagint. Uh, Shela, the difference is 403 versus 330, Masoretic versus Septuagint. For a bear, the difference is 430 versus 370. And then for Nahor, the difference is 119 versus 129. And obviously, because you're writing these out, I mean, automatically, 370 versus 430, you're not, there's no plausible scribal way to change that, even if it were digits, right? <laughs> if you've changed, you've changed two of those digits. That's not a simple change. Not like 160 versus 60, where you could imagine a stray mark becomes the hundred. No, these, the that, and, but then you also have words. And so to change the, the actual text of the scripture there you have to modify multiple words so it's not mm. plausible I, I don't even see a plausible way to attribute this to scribal mistakes this is something again that has been deliberately modified so you know looking at it and thinking all right well the the age of begetting is modified by exactly 100 years once again so, yay, it must be the same thing that's happening in Genesis 5. No, now we're going to modify those post-beginning ages just to mess with your brain. Um, <laughs> so it becomes a little more complicated, even though I think overall it sure looks like somebody's monkeying around with the actual chronological time span that's supposed to be represented by these by these uh, different genealogies. I think that's the, mm. that to me, that's an overriding pattern here, but there's clearly something more happening here, at least in Genesis yeah. 11 that we don't have in Genesis five. Yeah. So, so yeah, so far, so confusing. Yeah. yeah. So um, <laughs> one, one sort of added complicating factor that you haven't mentioned here, you kind of mentioned it earlier, but, yeah. but um uh, it was this question of the extra Canaan. Oh yeah, yeah. Now, when when I talk about Canaan, I'm not talking about the land of Canaan. Right, you know, that's kind of spelled different spelling. This is the mm -hmm. this is different spelling. This is the personal name Canaan. Yep. And there is an in, this entire generation that's kind of in the Septuagint, but it's not in in the Masoretic. Correct. Um, and what's interesting is that when we go to the New Testament, to the Gospel of Luke, and we look at Jesus' genealogy, um. Luke includes the Canaan, yes, that, that extra the generation. Extra he includes yeah. that. Luke, Luke chapter three, verse thirty-six. Um, Ma Matthew's genealogy do doesn't have it, but that's that's because um, his genealogy starts with Abraham, so he kind of misses misses all, all this that out. Stuff. So we yeah. don't know what. Yeah, um, but Luke Luke does include it, and he includes he includes Canaan. So you know, what are we to make of that? What is Luke doing here? Is is he quoting the Septuagint here? Boy. Um, so let me preface this. Um, there is another Canaan in the Genesis 5 genealogy. So we want to make sure that we, that listeners are not going to get confused if they try to look this up. It's bad enough looking all this stuff up to start with. Um, but yes, there is another Canaan and that is in, in Genesis 5. So we're talking about the Genesis 11 now. Um, are the, uh, is Luke here dependent on, um, the Septuagint? <sighs> I tried to, I tried to look this up a little more carefully. I know Matthew is a little odd. Um, Matthew quotes, and this is generally speaking across the New Testament. You will get quotations from the Old Testament follow the Septuagint wording really closely, word for word sometimes, where it's pretty obvious the author there had in front of him a copy of the Septuagint or had memorized the Greek version of that verse that he's quoting. 
and he has quoted it verbatim from the Septuagint. Then there are other places in Matthew, Matthew, for example, I know because I looked this up in Matthew, um, where quotations from the Old Testament don't match at all with the Septuagint wording. They use different words to translate the same passage. So it would seem, just to give you a headache, um, kind of a mix, right? Sometimes the New Testament authors will clearly quote from the Septuagint. Other times they seem to have a different version, a non-Septuagint manuscript, either the Hebrew or some other copy of the Old Testament, and they are translating on the fly. So in Luke 3, where you have the genealogy of Jesus, Luke's genealogy is really abbreviated. He's compiled it from multiple sources, including multiple places in the Old Testament. And so I think it's kind of impossible to know exactly how that Canaan ended up there that's not listed in the Masoretic version of Genesis chapter 11, right? So you could imagine, for example, that the Masoretic somehow over the years lost that generation and that Canaan, that that extra Canaan in the Septuagint is actually supposed to be there. Um, and so maybe Luke was using a Hebrew text that actually had the extra Canaan in it. And so it matches the Septuagint. Um, or you could imagine that Luke just used the Septuagint, right? So I, I don't know how to know that without knowing, you know, getting access to Luke's archive and his notes and stuff. Um, <laughs> I don't think we can know precisely. It's it, the only thing that we can say is Luke's, Luke's recording of the, the sequential generations in Jesus genealogy matches what we have there in Genesis 11 in the Septuagint. And we'll yeah. have to leave it at that. Okay. I, I mean, have, haven't we got another um, biblical witness to these genealogies um, in the first chapter of 1 Chronicles? Ah, um, yes. Does that help us at all? Well, you know, what, what do we see there? Oh, Paul, I'm glad you brought it up. You're going <laughs> to love this. In case you weren't confused enough and annoyed enough with uh. textual variations. Yeah. So, yeah. So first Chronicles uh, chapter one in the Masoretic. Um, the descendants of Shem. Noah's son Shem are listed twice, conveniently enough. Uh, 118 verse uh, chapter one, verse 18. We have uh, the phrase, the explicit phrase in the Masoretic. Our facts had begat. Shela. Now that's where Canaan should go, right? So that's an explicit place where the the First Chronicles passage agrees with what it says in the Masoretic. Uh, and then uh, in verse twenty four of the first chapter, we just have this list of descendants. Verse twenty four reads Shem, Arphaxad, Shela. Um, so it's not, it's a list of names, so it's not explicitly telling you so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, but if you, you know, you can read between the lines and compare it to Genesis, um, Genesis, uh, 11, and you would come up with, okay, well, those are sequential generations. So two places there where you could expect to see Canaan in the Masoretic, and you don't have it. It just goes, our facts had Shayla, or our facts had begat Shayla. Now, the problem with the Septuagint is that the text is really different. The Septuagint skips from verse 17 in chapter 1 all the way to verse 24. And it reads, as translated in English, it reads, The sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, Shela, Eber, Peleg, Ru. 
So that goes from the beginning of verse 17, the sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad. And then it skips to the last word of verse 24, which is Shelah. And then it just picks up from there. So the clear statement that Arphaxad begat Shelah, that's not there at all. That's just been dropped out altogether. And then you have this list of generations, which is really kind of odd because the first three names in that list, the sons of Shem, Elam, Ashur, and Arphaxad, they're presented as brothers in the Masoretic mm. text. They're not sequential generations. But then clearly Eber, Peleg, and Ru, that's sequential generations. So uh, <laughs> what am I supposed to take from this? I, I'm not sure. So if you were hoping to get some clarity there, which I was kind of hoping that would clear things up, I'm, I'm afraid we're back to square one. These genealogies are just different. And I'm not sure why the Septuagint has those differences, but I guess, you know, there is no Canaan between Arphaxad and Shela. If you're supposed to take that as meaning there's uh, there's a missing Canaan in, in the Septuagint, well, it's definitely missing in First Chronicles 1, but the differences are so much, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to interpret it. So. Well, okay. Um, yes, uh, I think my head's about ready to explode. Yeah, as we, me too. You know, I, I kind of work through all of this. Um, but, but we've still got some more questions we, we, we kind of need to ask about all of this. Yeah. Um, can we help to resolve any of these problems, these sort of variant readings, with other types of manuscript evidence? I mean, you know, can we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls? Right. Do, they, do they help us? Right. God? Right. So, yeah, so that's obviously where you got to go, right? You've got two, two manuscripts that you have that disagree. What you'd like to do is find an earlier manuscript and see what that one has. Um, mm. and, and we know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, a large fraction, not a majority, but close to it, um, the manuscripts, the biblical manuscripts there, um, align with the wording in the Masoretic that I'm talking about outside of Genesis, right? Uh, and so, so that's interesting. So that kind of gives me confidence that the Masoretic in general is going to be pretty close to, if not the exact original, it's going to be clearly the preferred text in, at that time period, at the time of Jesus. So that's nice. Um, but we also know in the in the in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's a there's a small fraction where the Hebrew text um, matches up pretty well with the Septuagint. Now, that's kind of surprising to a lot of people, I think, or at the time this was discovered, it was kind of surprising because people had just assumed that the the places where the Septuagint differs from the Masoretic is because the Septuagint translators didn't do a very good job. They either, you know, modified the meaning of the text or they added words or they took the words away, whatever. And now we have the this small fraction of of Masoretic text where the Hebrew does match what it says in the Septuagint. They're called proto-Septuagint texts, which then suggests that maybe there is a Hebrew, and this is the idea, right? This is what we want to sort of track down. Maybe there's a Hebrew text out there where the numbers that we have in the Septuagint are actually the same, and they're not the same as what we have in the Masoretic. So maybe there's a pre-Septuagint Hebrew manuscript that has the Septuagint numbers. So that's what we would want to go look for in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's completely absent. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked it up. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, so Genesis 5, there's a single word preserved from Genesis 5. <laughs> and you might be wondering, how do you know it's from Genesis 5 if it's just one word? And the answer is because it's on a fragment uh, where you have a longer part from Genesis 4 
And then the next column over, you just have one word left. And that's clearly from Genesis 5, but you have no idea where it goes, right? So we've got one word from Genesis 5, and it's not enough to, to establish anything interesting there. And we've got um, no representatives of First Chronicles at all in uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are not going to resolve, uh, unfortunately, these questions. Um, so we're going to have to look for uh, other manuscripts. Yeah, so that, that's the next question then. Are there some other ancient Hebrew manuscripts that we might need to have a look at? All right, so I checked out, the, the next big collection I know of that might have this is called um, the Oxyrhynchus, uh, no, not the Oxyrhynchus Papyri, that's a different collection, the Cairo Geniza. Let's talk about the Cairo Geniza. Oxyrhynchus is, is basically a manuscript dump that was found in Oxyrhynchus, ancient city of Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. Uh, it's mostly not biblical text. There are a few biblical texts there, mostly not. Um, the one that's interesting is the Cairo Geniza. Cairo Geniza, a Geniza is a room where you store old manuscripts uh, in a synagogue. And the Geniza, uh, the Ben Ezra synagogue in Cairo is where this Geniza was found in the end of the 19th century, full of manuscripts from basically the entire history of the Ben Ezra synagogue. And the Ben Ezra synagogue was built uh, originally built in the end of the ninth century. So the earliest manuscripts from the Cairo Geniza are late antiquity, early medieval. So maybe from the fifth, sixth century forward, right? That would be sort of late antiquity, early mid middle ages. Okay. So I went to the, and this is this is fun because uh, most of these manuscripts that they were purchased uh, from the synagogue in the 19th century and taken to Cambridge, right there uh, in your neighborhood, Paul. Uh, and uh, there's a bunch of them that are available online digitally, which is also very nice. And we're going to link to this manuscript uh, in the show notes so you can see it. And I found one. Shockingly enough, I found. A copy of Genesis 5. I have it right here. Here it is. Check it out. Um, this is uh, manuscript TSNS 4.3. That tells you nothing, but if you want to look it up, it's TSNS 4.3. This is the manuscript right here. And this column right here, that's uh, Genesis 5, verses 10 through 18. That is literally the middle of the genealogy, and you can see most of those words are there. And so this should tell us yeah. something. We can also point out here, if you might remember uh, when we talked to um, Doug Smith about the Masoretic, one of the things that he mentioned about the Masoretic is that uh, part of their program was to preserve the pronunciation, and they did that by adding vowels. The original Hebrew language was recorded in consonants only. And so you had to just know from context how to say it out loud and what the words would mean. Whereas the Masoretes went through and they added little dots around the letters so that you would have the vowels and know how to pronounce them. This has no dots. It is unpointed. Hmm. So it is not directly a product of the Masoretic school itself that would have put dots in it, right? Uh, paleographers, people who study ancient um, handwriting, they tell us that this is plausibly late antiquity, early medieval. So this is a very early manuscript. Maybe it's from the beginning of the time of the Masoretes. It may be a non-Masoretic or an early Masoretic uh, text. So the question is, what do we got here? And I don't read Hebrew, so I had to get out my Hebrew Bible and compare the words and uh, use my Hebrew Bible to see if the words were the same. So I'm going to switch back to my notes now because I don't read Hebrew and I can't tell you what's there. So I found on this manuscript um, two uh, beginning ages. So this is Genesis 5, 
Uh, there are two begetting ages here, one for the pre-flood Canaan, which is not the same as the Genesis 11 Canaan, uh, and one for Mahalalel. And these differ by 100 years between the Masoretic and the Septuagint. So the question is, do I have here a text that supports the Masoretic reading, or do I have one that is a Hebrew version of the Septuagint reading? And the answer is, this is word for word exactly what you find in the Masoretic text. So it is, at best, a proto-Masoretic manuscript. And there you go. This is, as far as I can tell, the earliest that I know of. I'm, I am no Hebrew expert, but I sort of try to keep up with this sort of stuff. This is the earliest um, manuscript of Genesis 5 that I know about. So that's pretty neat, I think. Yeah, but, I, that that that's that's very interesting. Um, although we have to point out this is this is a manuscript that is still from nine hundred years after the translation <laughs> of the Septuagint. Yes, so, probably. Um, you know, fr pro probably, pr yeah. probably from the times of the Masoretes. So, yeah. um, it's so maybe by that point we wouldn't expect to be finding sort of proto Septuagint manuscripts in any case. Correct. Because it's kind of too late. Correct. So, yeah. Um. But anyway, I mean, it is it is great to see that um, manuscript. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of reassuring. So, um, yeah. So why why don't we just sort of try to sort of wrap this up a bit? Um, yeah. What have we learned in this episode? <laughs> I, I, have have we sort of got to the point where we where, where we say to ourselves, well, you know, this is just such a kind of hopeless knot. That we're never going to untangle it, you know. How are we ever going to have any prospect of resolving any of this? And yeah. um, um, what does it all really amount to in the end? Yeah. So yeah, you might also think, you know, if there's these unresolvable differences, you know, how can we know the important parts of the Bible, like yeah. you know, the history of Israel and prophecies of Jesus and so forth? And I think you know. We, we have to sort of step back for a second and remind ourselves this is not about doctrine. Um, this is not about this is not about essential doctrine. Um, this is essentially a number that is different <laughs> in, in one manuscript versus another. Obviously a set of numbers, but it boils down to the age of the earth according to the text. Um, so it's not, it's not threatening any of our doctrines. Um, and it, you know, we've sort of looked at this and some of these differences, we can say that looks like a scribal error. At least it's plausible that I could imagine a scribe making a mistake in this way. And so the Lamic problems seem to be mostly scribal things. Um, the, the differences in the begetting ages they seem to be very deliberately chronological. I just have a hard time getting away with getting away from that because it's they it it's exactly the ages that you would need to change if you wanted to expand or contract your your time span there. And it's yeah, I mean it 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 makes sense in the chronology, but you also have the issue of the in in 11 you have the issue of the post beginning ages which are also randomly weirdly different so chronology seems to be the main thing but it's not unfortunately the only thing and i don't know exactly how we're going to explain that um but the big thing seems to be those 100 year differences that seems to be the major change and that seems to be plausibly related to the in to the total time span being described in that in that in that genealogy, which then relates to, you know, motivations. Now we can start thinking about who's got the right motive to make these differences and and what kind of evidence can we garner from other sources that might tell us about the early, the original reading of the text. So Things like Demetrius, the chronographer, things like um, Josephus, 
Can we start marshalling uh, evidence from other places that might tell us which reading is the first, is the original reading? And then we can start to think about, okay, this must have been the change and this must be the reason why, uh, based on motives. But otherwise, don't panic. Don't throw your Bible out. Don't throw your Old Testament out. And frankly, I don't even think you have to stop being a young age creationist, even if you don't know exactly the age of the earth to the year. We still have Genesis 1 with its complete creation in six days. We still have um, the global flood and and all of the geological upheaval that that implies. Maybe we can't say for sure it was 4004 BC, but I'm not sure that is an absolutely critical, crucial piece of information to know that you have to know in order to be a legitimate young age creationist. You can be yeah. pretty agnostic on that point And I think still yeah. come away from the text going, yeah, this is not a long time. Yeah. And, and a, a 7,500 year old earth and a 6,000 year old earth, both of them are light years away from, you know, the, the conventional age of, of the earth. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, yeah, so you're right. So this doesn't jeopardize a young age creationist position in no. any sense at all. No. Um, it it's it's a fairly minor sort of point about exactly yeah. you know how old the Earth is, but it doesn't, yeah, doesn't affect that the Earth is young, right? Uh, yeah. So so that's that's yeah. So that's that's kind well. of reassuring after all, really. I I suppose you know as as we've sort of waded our way like sort of wading through treacle through all of this detail, <laughs> which is which is tough. You know, it's, it's it, it gets very complicated. Yeah. Um, but it's important, I think, to, to to think about it. So, yeah. So I th I think that's kind of reassuring at the end at the end of all that, really. So I guess the question we, we've gone long on this. Um, oh, I, I think okay. we've we, we've yeah, I think we have. Um, uh, but that's okay. Um, I I hope our listeners are still with us. Um, <laughs> what's next? What's next in this, in this uh, series? Because there, uh, there's there's yeah, so many series. options. I mean, we could go into the into the into the period of the kings which is another big thing. We could talk about the yeah. time uh, Israel sojourned in Egypt. That's another big area of question. We could, yeah. we could even bring up the, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch because Paul, there's a third <laughs> chronology in case you weren't annoyed enough. There's another one. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't thought about that. <laughs> and one of the other things, you know, we, the patriarchal lifespans, I, one of the things I see currently is, some Bible scholars who are questioning the, you know, how we should read those patriarchal lifespans and are they to be understood in a straightforward way or yeah. are they symbolic or, you know, something like that. So that's another topic. That's we another could, big one. We yeah. Think about. So, yeah. So there's a number of different directions we could go here and I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to this whole sort of chronology question at some point. Um, yeah. We've got plenty to talk about. I think that's that's it for this time. As I say, we've we've gone long, so I, I hope we haven't sort of tested your pa patience too much. But uh, you know, this is an important question. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, we we hope that you'll join us uh, next time for our uh, next episode. I, I don't know what's uh, coming up, but I'm sure it will be it will be lots of fun. Uh, in the meantime, you know, make sure that you hit that subscribe button, and uh, and uh, we'll yeah we'll see you in a couple of weeks. So bye for now. Yep. See you later. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.